Good afternoon and welcome to honestly what I think is probably one of the most important in this workshop series. It's one of the most important ones I'm going to go over is that I've kind of come and really it's come to me more crystal clear as I've gone through this summer doing this workshop series that the quality of the teaching and what I'm teaching is critical. It's important. But I'm really seeing even more clearly than I did before. And I always thought this to some extent, but even more clearly now, that how we relate to our students, the relationship we have with our students, that it sets the tone for everything. It just, it's foundational. Um, and so I really want to just take the time today to go through that. Um, I grew up in Marietta, Georgia. My mom's a teacher, my aunt's a teacher. Um, and so I've got some teaching background there. My mom taught seventh grade though. Um, seventh grade's okay, eighth grade, and then taught that one time, never again. Um, middle school's tough. Um, I spent most of my career in high school, um, have a degree in chemical engineering, and then also in secondary science education with a focus in chemistry. And I've been teaching chemistry since 2001. I've also been an administrator in that time period um, for a couple of years. And so I kind of see teaching from both sides, from both the administrator side and the teaching side. And then I started this company a little over a year ago. So why does our relationship with our students matter? Um, really simply, um, you, know, you can think about what is the foundation of your class? And you're like, well, it's the content or it's my instruction. Well, to be honest with you, I honestly think that the foundation of your class is your relationship with your students. Because that's what your teaching goes on top of. Because how well your students receive what you're teaching is dependent upon that relationship with them. How you present the stuff to them, like you will be affected in how you present it based on your relationship with them. That I really feel that it is the foundational thing because poor relationships dramatically impact your class. You know, they're going to do things like affect your student engagement. You know, because if students don't like you, or students don't feel like you're fair or you're nice or whatever they may complain about. And I'm not saying never complain about these things. I've had kids complain about all those things at some point in time about me. Um, but as a general rule, um, when kids, when you have that rocky relationship with a the kid, they're not going to be engaged as much. Um, you're going to have classroom management issues with them. Um, their performance isn't going to be as good because they're not going to be willing to put in the effort because that relationship's not there. Um, and then it's also going to end up affecting your pacing. And that when we don't have good relationships with our students, it really does ripple out into every other area of our classroom. And I think that's critically important for us to realize. It's one of those things that I don't think we, we talk about very much. We talk about how we need to love on our kids and that kind of stuff. And I think it gets talked about a lot on the elementary school level. You know, because they're all about like loving on their kids and being all that. But for us, the high school level, I don't know, we don't talk about our relationship with our students very much. We don't talk about what it means. And I think we do that to our detriment. And so that's one of the reasons why I think it's critical because you know, think about it. What you have in your environment as a school affects how you work as an employee. Now, do you have a school where it is safe to risk and kind of mess up occasionally and you know your administrator's got your back? Or you have that administrator who's just going to nitpick, and as soon as you make a mistake, you know you're going to get nailed to the wall. Um, I've had both. Um, I had you know, an administrator my very first teaching job, uh, our headmaster. The general rule was keep your mouth shut, keep your head down, and do your job. You did not want to get his attention. You did not want him to notice you because he was going to find something to berate you about. I mean, this is a guy who one time we had some kids talking in assembly. And he chewed out the teacher who was sitting three chairs down for not correcting them. He chewed out a teacher in front of the entire assembly. Um, now, that affects school culture. It affects your ability to teach. It affects your comfort level. Um, versus, you know, I've had you know, situations where I knew that actually, even if I screwed up and I was in the wrong, I had administrators that were going to back me up and kind of work with me and make it a very teachable moment. And that was freeing. Um, and we've all had that. And so, Think about it. that. That that works the same way in the classroom. Are your kids sitting there waiting for you to correct them on something, to to pounce on them, or do your kids feel safe to struggle and in, in, in with the learning process and all that? So, for me, I have three rules. 
these are my three rules that kind of govern how I deal with teenagers and it governs what I'm doing in class. And so rule one, treat others how you want to be treated. Key thing here, that's not for them. This is for me. I'm, you know, I'm not telling the kids, hey, treat others how you want to be treated. No, I'm telling myself that. I'm telling myself, hey, treat my students how I want to be treated. Um, and I think that's a critical distinction to make because, you know, how would I want to be treated? I'd want to be treated, you know, by an authority figure. I'd want to be treated with respect. I'd want them, if I bring them concern, I want them to listen to me and not just blow me off and dismiss me. Um, I want the authority figure to have my back. You know, they're for me and with me. Those are things I want. Um, what about from the students? I want the students to respect me. Um, I want the students to be on task and be prepared. And so I'm going to do those things. And so I'm a big proponent of, hey, I want my students to respect me and be prepared. So I need to do that. I need to model that. Um, we also have to be aware of our assumptions. Um, it is easy, and I don't, I'm not sure if you've ever done this teaching, but I know I have. You know, my back's to the kids. I'm writing something on the board. I hear somebody talking. I turn around, and I just weigh in to John because I know it was John who was talking. Well, then Ben, who's sitting next to him, chirps up and says, no, Mr. Anderton, that was me, not John. Because I made assumptions. I was filling in this narrative before actually interacting with John or anybody else. And because it's not helpful to fill in this narrative on your own. You know, so when we're dealing with students, is we can assume that, like, you know, that behavior issue. We can assume that it's because they don't like us or they're being disrespectful or whatever. We can fill in the narrative. As opposed to, well, maybe they had a bad bad class last period. Maybe they failed the class last period and they're just uptight and they're scared about talking to their parents and it's kind of coming out in my classroom. You know, there are things that we don't, we don't know the whole narrative. And so we need to be cautious about making assumptions. Um, you know, one of the things my wife and I use, and we use it just for marital relationships, is if my wife says something that hurts my feelings or she's trying to tell me something and I'm not sure how she wants me to receive it, um, I generally respond is what I heard you say is because I'm then trying to re repeat back what I heard. Um, so like with a student, it's like I would vary it a little bit. It's like, hey, when you did that, it, it really, I heard or I felt that you just don't want to be here right now. Um, can you help me understand? Um, and then you can have that conversation. Once again, that's more of a one-on-one -on -one conversation than a in front of the whole class conversation usually. Sometimes it needs to happen in front of the whole class depending upon the nature of disruption. But be careful how we assume what's going on with kids because teenagers are complicated. Um, they got a lot of stuff going on in their lives and it's gonna come out in their behavior because they haven't learned how to hide their emotions and cloak everything up as well as adults do. And so when they're upset about something else, it's gonna come out as being upset at me. Um, and we just gotta kind of figure that out as we go along. So, and this is the one I, I've run into, and this is one when I was an administrator drove me nuts. Um, I'd be talking with a teacher, and they'd be like, well, Susie doesn't respect me. I'm like, well, how, what's that relationship look like? Describe that to me. And basically, the teacher will be like, well, she doesn't do what I tell her to do. She doesn't, I'm like, do you respect her first? I shouldn't have to. She's me. I'm the authority figure. She should be respecting me. And then I'd try to work on coaching. The teacher was like, actually, because you're the authority figure? It's your job to take the first step. It's your first job to model what you want. You know, the gold rule, treat others how you want to be treated. It's, it's, it's not expect them to treat you how you want them to treat you. You know, it's not hold them to the standards of how you want to be treated. That's not what it says. The, the golden rule says treat others. So you initiate. <laughs> you do it first. So show your kids respect. When they talk to you, listen. Novel concept. Um, don't just dismiss them. Um, don't just lord your authority over them, that kind of thing. Um, so it's my job to make the first move. Um, I think that's critical. All right. Um, my rule two. Um, rule two and rule three go together. And for a long time, these were my, my two rules, and then I added the first one. All right. So I would treat you like an adult until your actions deem otherwise. 
here's what I mean by that. Teens are no longer little kids. Um, and in fact, if you want to anger a teenager, there's no quicker way than to treat them like a child. Um, they will buck up. They will get upset. They will get mad at you in a heartbeat if you start treating them like a child. You know, that's just not what they, they, they don't want to be treated like a child. They're like, I'm not in elementary school anymore. I'm not, a, you know, and they don't like that. Um, and so I avoid that. I treat them like an adult. Um, what does that look like? So, and the reason being, and I'll get to what I want to talk in a second, but the reason being is our goal, end goal for them is different. That for little kids, it's all about prepping, prepping them for the next grade. You know, when I was teaching sixth grade, my job for sixth grade was to get them ready for seventh grade. For chemistry, it's different. You're dealing with 10th, 11th, and 12th graders. Part of your job is getting them ready for the next grade. Part of your job is getting them ready for college. But really, a big part of your job, and once again, this is one of those things I don't think it's talked about enough, part of your job is to prepare them for life outside of school. Um, for entering into the workforce. Like, what if they're not going to go to college? What if they're just going to go get a job right out of school? Or preparing them for have that job after they get out of college. We need to start working on just some of those, just what does it mean to be an adult? Um, and that's part of how they learn to be an adult is to act like one. Um, it's for me to treat them like one. And then that helps them to learn how to be an adult. Um, and so I'm a big fan of that, that it's, we're all about prepping them to do life on their own. So what does this look like? Um, number one, I listen to them. When my students come to me with a complaint, I may have to coach them on how to come to me with a complaint, because oftentimes they do it wrong to start with, but I teach them, I train them, and we'll kind of get that with rule three. But when they come to me with a complaint, I listen. Hey, Mr. Anderton, we got three tests on Friday. Can we do something about that? I'll listen. I'm not saying I'm going to change my mind. I mean, but I, I let them know I'm the authority and I'm going to make the final decision, but I'm going to listen. I'm going to value what they have to say. I'm going to take a moment out of our class at the beginning to listen and value and have a conversation with them like adults, because um, that's critical. It's important for them to feel heard because um, that, that's part of that respect piece. They feel respected and then they tend to behave better. But just listening to them and not just dismissing them, not just playing the, well, I'm the teacher and I said so card. Now, there are times to play that card, um, but not too often. Um, I rarely use that. Like, just like I try to very rarely with my kids be like, because I said so. Um, I'm willing to kind of work with them, but I also kind of get to be like, hey, guys, you get, your, you get to have input, but you don't get to make the decision. Um, I'm the authority figure, I'm the parent, or I'm the teacher, I get to make the decision. Um, and so I do that with them. So, like I said, I, you, I, you have to maintain authority because my goal is to not be their peer. Um, that's not my, my job in life. Um, I'm not their peer. Um, I am an authority figure. I am a teacher. Um, I am not going to be... I don't do high fives with my kids. I don't do fist pumps a whole lot. I do it like very rarely. When there's something really to celebrate, um, I'll kind of break those out, but that's just not me. Um, you know, when I'm teaching sixth graders, I'm not, I don't do hugs very much with my kids. Like I didn't do hugs, I didn't do high fives, but that's just not my personality. I saved that for later because I'm not your peer. And I would have kids get frustrated with me that I wouldn't interact with them like a peer. And I'm like, guys, I'm your teacher. There's a, there's, I'm going to respect you. I'm going to listen to you. We're going to have this good relationship, but you need to understand that there's a separation. Um, that I'm not your best friend. Um, you know, because then if you're like, oh, buddy, buddy, and you get to the point where you got to do some type of discipline, it complicates things. Um, it makes things a little difficult at times. It can strain relationships. It can strain your ability to do discipline. Um, so we have to maintain at least some type of separation in my mind. Um, you know, like my kids will, my students will tell you that I'm for them and with them and I respect them and, you know, that I am kind. But I don't think any of my students would have told me that was their friend. Because um, that, once again, that's not my role. 
Uh, my friends are in their 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s. Um, I have adult friends. <laughs> Those are my friends. Those are who I talk to. Those are who I run life problems with. Um, I don't discuss life problems with my kids. I discuss life. You know, hey, what did you do this weekend? Oh, yeah, we went to the park with the kids and we did this. And they're like, oh, that's awesome. I love that park. You know, like we would have conversations like that, but I'm not going to, you know, I had a fight with my wife last night about da-da-da-da. No, I'm not having that conversation with my students. Um, like, once again, I'm treating them like adults, but I'm not treating them like my friends. Um, there's a difference there. And I think that's a very critical distinction to make. All right. Rule number three. Um, teenagers are teenagers. I will not hold them to the standard of adults. Because like kind of I mentioned, like, they're learning how to be adults. And just like when I'm teaching something for the first time, like when I'm teaching conversions for the first time, and kids make mistakes like the first day we're doing conversions, it's not a big deal. We, we, we correct it, we fix it, we move on. I'm not going to ding their grade really bad for it. It's just, hey, you made some mistakes, let's move on. But for the test, I expect them to have mastered it by that point in time. And so my standard for what I expect them to know and expect them to do is higher. So for me, it kind of goes the same way here, that when I'm trying to teach them how to be an adult, if, you know, early on when I'm trying to teach them a certain skill, I expect them to make mistakes. I expect them to mess it up. But as we move along, I expect them to get more and more competent with it. Um, and that's kind of the process. So it's like I kind of take the learning process and I apply it to learning to be an adult because um, they're not adults. Now, it's, it's crazy when we expect a 17-year-old to act like they're 30 and make really good choices. That's not going to happen. <laughs> You know, I mean, I just find it comical sometimes. People are like, why did they do that? I'm like, because they're a teenager. They make mistakes. They make stupid choices because they think they know everything and they don't. Um, I mean, that's just kind of the norm. And so I get confused as to why that happens. And so, for example, I try to avoid the phrase, they should know better because they may not. Um, you know, a classic example is like they come into my class upset about what happened in the previous class class period about when they got a test back and they're mad about how the history teacher graded one of the essays and they'll be like I'm so I'm like hey did you talk to Mr. Brown about that they're like yeah we did and he just blew us off I'm like well how did you bring it up well we said da da da, da. I'm like oh okay let's take a step back guys listen to what you just said if I were to say that to you how would you feel um that you were attacking us Bingo, you know, and so I got, I'm taking a step back because once again, I have, um, part of this goes back to my teaching philosophy. My teaching philosophy is that my job is to teach the whole child. And that includes this whole learning how to be an adult thing. Um, and so for me, my class time is for anything that involves teaching the child. And so if I need to take five, 10 minutes to have a conversation with them about, hey guys, here's the appropriate way to approach an authority figure when you have a disagreement. Then I'm going to do that because I find that that's educational. I'm teaching them. That's a valid use of class time. Um, yes, I'm hired to be a chemistry teacher, but I'm also there to teach that child. And so I'm gonna teach them, hey guys, so what would it look like, how would you feel if I came to you and I said it this way, and I propose a different way of saying it. And they're like, oh, that feels better. I'm like, so how do you think Mr. Brown would feel if you came to him with that, that way? They're like, he would feel better. I'm like, exactly. Because when you feel attacked, how are you going to respond? You're going to be defensive. You know? And so I guide them through how to interact with an adult that you disagree with. Um, because this isn't just a high school skill. You know, it's a skill for later on in life. How many times have I had a disagreement with an administrator? And I have to go to that administrator and approach them and have a dialogue with them without angering them, without putting them on the defensive and being able to have a good conversation with them. It's a life skill that I'm trying to teach these kids. Um, how to do forgiveness when you hurt somebody's feelings. How to respond when somebody hurts your feelings. Life skills. Um, 
you know, how to balance when you, you mess up, how to tell the truth when you mess up, how to own your stuff. These are all skills that I'm trying to teach them and, and they're going to learn how to use sarcasm. You know, like kids will cross the line with sarcasm and I kind of try to coach them. And so I avoid they should know better. And I really work on this, this mindset of, all right, they cross a boundary, they do something wrong or they make a bad choice. Then I tell them where the boundary is. I'm saying, hey, right here is where you went wrong. You shouldn't have done this. All right. So what would the appropriate response have been? And I guide them through what that would look like. And then from that point on, they're now held accountable to this new standard. I've explained the standard to them. I've taught it to them. They're now accountable to it. And I'm going to hold them accountable to it. So that if they cross that line sarcasm wise, we got an issue. If they have an issue with a question with me on a test and they approach me in the improper way, I'm going to hold them accountable and say, no, back up, try again. I'm not answering that question the way you asked it. Um, I do this with my, my six-year-old. You know, when he demands something instead of asking for something, I'm like, that's not how you ask for something. No, I hold the standard. I'm not going to just like give in to him because he asked wrong. He decided to demand. Um, same thing with a teenager. I'm trying to coach them through it. Um, but I hold the standard once I explain it. Um, and getting all angry at them just generally doesn't work. Um, this works well with academic skills too, like turning in homework, studying, that kind of thing. All right. The key to this rule is I'm trying to be a safe place. I'm trying to be a safe place for them to struggle academically. You know, as chemistry is kind of that first class where a lot of them are going to start to struggle. You know, a lot of your brighter kids are used to kind of just memorizing facts and spitting the stuff out. And also they hit chemistry and like it's hard. And they actually have to put in more time than just doing the homework sometimes. That's novel to them. They haven't had to do that yet. <laughs> you know, and teaching them through that. Um, same thing with behavior. It's, it's about being a safe place for them to do something. Um, example for this would be um, when I taught sixth grade, um, I had them do a research project on weather, extreme weather patterns. And up until this point, they were used to, what is a tornado? They were used to writing down one sentence, maybe two, and that would be their answer. And then like, what causes tornadoes? What type of damage do they do? And like, I'd give them like six questions and they're used to like basically turning in maybe a page worth of information saying, oh, there's my project. And I'm like, no, that's not how you do research. <laughs> um, let me start trying to teach you how to really do research. And so what I would do is I would like try to teach them, but it's their first time doing it. They're going to make mistakes. And so when I got the notes back, I would grade it. Like, I mean, my comments would be fairly strict, fairly hard. Like, hey, what's this? You know, you need to ask this question. You need to answer this question. Hey, um, you need a lot more here. Oh, you don't need this. I put all these comments on it, but I would grade it really leniently. But then they would have to turn it around and make it into a PowerPoint project. And I expected every one of those mistakes to get fixed before the final project. And if they didn't, then their grade got knocked. So I, hey, guys, here's the boundary. Here's the standard. You know, I'm trying to raise you up, so let me help you get there. This is where you got on your first attempt. Okay, let me put it now up here now now close that gap um, and so we do that with our kids in terms of behavior we do it with our kids in terms of academics that we're trying to push them and teach them but we're trying to be a safe place at the same time a place where it's okay to learn a place where it's okay to make mistakes um, I think that's critical all right so undergirding all of this is my my pedagogy of what I really think drives my teaching philosophy. If you win their hearts, you're going to win their minds. Um, if I have a good relationship with my kids, if my students know that I am with them and for them, and part of that's this relationship, but part of it also is, um, if you've watched any of my other workshops, student-driven pacing, that I, I let their understanding and their comprehension drive how fast I go. And if they're not getting it, I'm gonna take extra time to make sure they get it. That communicates I'm with them, I'm for them. Um, how I answer questions in class and how I ask questions in class, I'm trying to communicate that same thing again. I'm trying to communicate always to my students with most of the choices I make, that I'm with you and I'm for you. And what that does is that wins their hearts. And when you win your students' hearts, their minds are sure to follow.
um, that if a kid has to decide between doing my homework and another teacher's homework, if they, you know, they're going to choose the, the, the teacher that they respect to choose. They're going to choose to do the homework for the teacher they respect. They're going to choose to do the homework for the teacher that they like more or however that may be they're, That's going to drive their decision as to what's going to get done and what's not going to get done. Um, that plays a role. And so my kids will work harder for me when I start pushing and I start pushing them to do harder things. If they know I'm going to be with them and I'm going to be for them, I can push them and I can push them harder than I can if I don't have that relationship with them. And I think that's critical. Um, once again, I, I said this before, my goal is not to be friends with my students. Um, my goal is to be kind of that mentor, that person who's teaching them not just about chemistry, but about life. Um, that I've run into some of my students afterwards and just had great conversations about what's going on with them. Um, Cause we have that mutual respect for one another. We can have good conversations. Um, generally they don't duck their heads and try to hide from me. Um, I've stuck my head and hid from them a couple times, but not that way. Um, like I said, my goal is to be that caring adult for them to learn. Cause they may not get this at home. They may not have parents who care for them and are for them. They may feel alone. If I can give that to my kids, if I can give them that experience of like, wait a second, there is somebody out there who cares about me, who listens to me, who values what I says, who thinks I'm, I'm somebody worth listening to. That's a lesson I want to teach my kids. That's a lesson I want my students to learn. Um, and I think that's critically important. Um, my students know that I'm for them and with them. That's a big thing. Okay, when they do that, their engagement's going to improve. Their behavior improves. Um, I get chit chat a lot, but that's kids in a social setting. It's going to happen. Um, chit chat doesn't, but eventually, if I when I need, need to crack down, they'll, they'll crack it down. But that's my biggest behavior issue that I generally have in class is talking. Um, I don't deal with a whole lot of blatant disrespect. I don't deal with a whole lot of of those more extreme behavior issues because they're just not there. Um, because of this relationship factor going on. Um, and when I do have those, I generally have enough of a relationship with those kids that I can pull them out in the hall and we can have a real honest conversation about it. Um, and then they're gonna generally rein themselves in. Because when I have that relationship with them and we run into a behavior issue, I have grounds to stand on. Um, once again, if, if they know I'm with them and for them and we're out in the hall talking, they know that my objective is not to bust them and send them to detention. They know that my goal is my heart is for their heart. And that makes all the difference. When they know that my heart is for their heart, they trust me. And they trust me in a way that allows my teaching to be so much better. I really think it's that critically important. Um, you know, and then also moving down the pipeline, it makes my job easier later. Um, that when, you know, in school, I gain that reputation of being that teacher who's, who's, I'm tough, I'm not an easy teacher, but I'm fair and I'm going to make sure they're prepared and I'm gonna be with them and for them as I push them to that tough standard. You know, I'm that teacher who, you know, my final exam, it's going to take most of my kids the entire exam period to do it. It's going to be comprehensive. My bright kids may be able to do it in a little over an hour. Um, this is like a two hour exam block. Um, I am tough. I don't, I don't want a piece of cake class. I want to teach my kids. I want to push them. But the rec I have a reputation with my students who are coming up of like, ooh, this is going to be a challenging class but we're gonna make it because Mr. Anderson's with us and he's for us. They're not gonna use those words, but you know, they know, they enter in with confidence that I'm gonna help them get through it. Um, and you build that reputation and all of a sudden you get to build these relationships and that stuff is kind of already done for you because your reputation precedes you um, and it ripples out. And I think that's a great thing also in teaching that you kind of get to build that over time. Um, or like my second school I taught at, um, it was a really small private school. 
And I basically taught kids ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade. And so by the time they're seniors, I mean, our relationship's amazing. And they know, I mean, I'm going to push them and I'm going to push them hard and they're going to go with me. Um, because that's the relationship we had. And it was awesome. I really enjoyed that aspect of it. Um, it was great getting to know them over four years and watching them grow up and all that kind of stuff. All right, so the road forward. Um, school started for most of you. Um, some of you, school starts, you know, next week or so. I'm, gonna, I'm probably going to be doing a couple more workshops during the school year. I'm not sure what that calendar is going to look like, but next week's my last one for the summer workshop series. And we hit Labor Day weekend, and then we kind of see where we go from there. So the road forward looks like, what can I offer you? So first and foremost, I have the lounge. Um, the lounge is my free Facebook community. It's a great place for you to meet and interact with teachers who think like you do, who are passionate about chemistry, but also want to have a community where we can talk to each other. So many of us are the only chemistry teacher in our school, um, and that's just tough. Um, so there's that group. Then there's um, my mini course, student engagement mini course. It's just uh, 12 short lessons on how to improve your engagement, improve your teaching quality and efficiency, and improve your student learning. And it's very practical. Um, then the crash course, for those of you who are new to teaching chemistry, if you're starting to get overwhelmed already by trying to learn all the chemistry that you need to learn, let me teach you. I guarantee you I can make it faster and easier than trying to get it from a book. Um, and I can save you hours, I promise. Um, and there's a money back guarantee on that one. If you start it and you, you're not satisfied that it's giving you what you need, you can ask for your money back. Um, same thing with the academy. Um, here, you don't have to go it alone and you don't have to spend hours doing your, your prep because I will help you. I give you everything you need in terms of resources, but then I also give you support so that you're not doing it alone on your own. Um, and so with both of those, for the academy, you can see a sample page of what that looks like by going to teachinghighschoolchem.com slash member slash covalent. Um, that's my entire page on covalent nomenclature. It's got notes, PowerPoints, videos, handouts, classwork, homework, quizzes, tests, review sheets, all that's there and all that's yours to download and use how you want. Um, and so that's a re free resource I'm giving to you um, that I want you to use. Um, but it kind of gives you a taste of what that looks like. Um, and then more information is just found at teachinghighschoolchem.com slash courses. Um, really, time's running out for you to be able to get resources that are going to help you for the year. Um, I think if you start waiting too much longer, you're going to get too busy into the year to really utilize any resource that I can give you. Or it makes it harder. I will say I'm not able to use it, but it makes it harder when we get busier and busier into the school year. Um, and that's one of the things I want to offer you is just take advantage of it now. Get it now before the school year gets too crazy um, and just really work on basically fast tracking your success and your growth. Um, that's what I really want to offer you. So um, it's been great hanging with y'all today. Um, if you have any questions, uh, just throw them in the chat and I will answer those questions. Otherwise, I look forward to seeing you next week.